This morning I'm going to do a couple things. I uh, want to just give a kind of a preamble on reflections on who we are, what we're called to do, and how we do it. That'll just be the preamble. And then I want to go to the scriptures and show some new ways we can engage in the word to augment our learning. Uh, as uh, leaders in this university, we primarily attract people to be learners with us by modeling learning before them. And so as we cultivate that hunger and thirst in our own lives for more and more of God, his character, his ways, then um, we draw other people with that same sense. So let's look this morning a little bit at some of these themes. Whom shall we serve? I I'm going to do a couple of things that we've heard for many, many years and do some modifications of them. And... Uh, and see what you think about this. We've, uh, in our very first uh, SOE in Switzerland, uh, Francis Schaeffer came and showed about the four basic presuppositions of biblical Christian worldview. And th that language has been used in our syllabus and documents and writing throughout the, uh, these many years. And th this is not new stuff for you, but it's, let me just... Uh, these are some propositional concepts. That's what uh, presuppositional means, is before you start thinking, uh, before you start uh, communicating ideas, these are things that you take for granted. They are givens. And this is what is reality. That God is infinite, it means beyond our human understanding of limitations, and uh, personal. He's got those capacities of intellect, will, emotions, and creativity, and many other things that enable him to have loving relationships with other persons. And uh, hu humanity, Francis would have said man, but human beings, are finite and personal. So there are things in which we are like God, and there are things which we are not like God. Um, he has made us with things, with shared aspects so that we could have a loving relationship with him. So we could receive his love, and um, respond to his love and love one another. Uh, Francis went on to say that truth is constant and knowable. Uh, I really appreciate that word constant rather than absolute. I think it, you can work with that a little bit more. And, uh, and truth and choices are significant and have consequences. And uh, what Francis taught in that first school and laid a groundwork for us was that, and of course this was the uh, late 60s, and uh, everything was being questioned by that generation, and you needed to have some solid stakes in the ground. What, wh what is real? When people were exploring every kind of oriental mysticism and having experiences with drugs, and they were casting off uh, accepted uh, uh, parameters that had been uh, embraced by society for generations. And so this was saying that your choices really are important, and these, uh, these four ideas are behind every verse, every passage in Scripture. Even when it's not stated, you must see that they are there. This is the warp and woof of life, as it were. When we were uh, working on uh, the sphere view, uh, which we're going to get to in just a little bit, and the app, and I, I've done this for years, and DNAs and stuff like that, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not teaching this with you. I'm just reminding you of this, okay? Because I assume that you all know this and have taught this. And, uh, have been, and so uh, this would be impact in other ways. But just, this is just a reminder. I was struck that there was something missing. While all of this is true, there's, there's another element. There's an element of partnership and purpose that that intrinsic to every aspect, every statement, every story in the scriptures that God wants to do stuff with us. It's not just that our choices are significant and have consequences. That's, that's, that's a very neutral, bland statement. True, it's not bland. It's, it's very powerful. But that there is, we're not entering into a neutral zone. There is an intentional purpose that he has, and that purpose is to be done together. And so when we did the sphere view, 
and the, the presuppositions of biblical Christian worldview, we added a fifth one. And a fifth basic presupposition is called to be change makers with God is how we did that. And just, but it's issues of transformation, of mission, of uh, reformation, of ushering in the kingdom of God. And it's with God. It's in partnership with him, out of fellowship with him, walking through life's journey with him. And so I just like to propose that because for years we've just heard the four basic presuppositions that particularly as uh, a university embedded in a mission, we have a mandate. And that mandate is, is stated clearly in uh, the first chapter of Genesis and is implicit all the way throughout the, the, the meta story of scriptures. So I just want to leave that for your reflection. Okay? Then, then the question is, whom shall we serve? Okay, so w- we have been called to service. We've been called to mission. We've been called to transformation. We've been called to do that in the context of relationship and intimacy. So whom shall we serve? And, and the first thing is God. Now, quickly, please, th- I'm not talking about doing things for God. Wh- when we serve God, what does it really mean? How is he served by us? By us desiring to be with him. It, it's that place of intimacy. It's that place of walking with him. He, that's what he designed us for. There's nothing beyond that. He, just, he made us out of love and for love to be loved and to reciprocate love. That's just... And so how we serve God is not uh, a multitude of activities. Activities do get involved. But it's just this, this posture of pursuit of God. Uh, last week I, I spoke to the president's gathering and I was reading through the past number of months again and again the lives of the kings. And I realized I'm not going to give that message here, but if you want to look at a very interesting study, just look at the word, he sought God, he did not seek God. And, you know, the difference between Saul and David, they both blew it royally. <coughs> I mean, David, murder, adultery, uh, the, the, the census was an expression of authoritarianism, of domination. He almost, he almost uh, succumbed to violence for cause of materialism with the situation of Nabal. And if Abigail had not intervened, uh, it would have been blood on his hands. There were just a number of things. But every time he blew it and a prophet came, he quickly acknowledged the failure and sought God. Whereas Saul, he didn't seek God. He tried to cover up. He said, he tried to make excuses. He tried to pin the blame on others. And he... uh, uh, just said, you know, Samuel, would you just stand here with me so it looks good? And th- his last chapter of his life story, instead of seeking God, he's seeking the witch of Endor. Yeah. And um, he's looking in all the wrong places. So it's not about, you know, I've often wondered, how can you God say that David is a man after God's own heart? I mean, adultery, murder, violence. And, uh, but he sought God. He, he was quick to repent, and he was tender-hearted, and he walked in that dependency. And when, when that was broken, he, well, he, he quickly recognized it and, and returned to that place of, uh, of pursuit. And so uh, I think this is what God's just calling us to. Not flawlessness in our leadership, but passionate pursuit of him in our leadership. And when we blow it, to reignite that as quickly and as fully, as transparently, as wholeheartedly as possible. So we have amazing scriptures like Joshua. He says, choose today whom you will serve. We, me and my family, not just individual, but a corporate expression, we will serve the Lord. And this was about uh, where is the devotion of your heart going to? Is it going to go after idols? Is it going to go after God? You have Samuel at the time of the establishment of the king, kings, he charges the people of Israel, serve the Lord with all your heart. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully. This is, you know, footnote David Cole's message from the other day. Uh, fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he's done for you. 
You know, we're walking in a relationship of intimacy with him and he's, he's reached out to us and our, our response to him is exactly that, a response because of his great initiative. Um, and Paul says, speaking of God, whom I serve with all my heart, says the NLT, literally it means whom I serve in the spirit by spreading the good news about his son. And he, he's doing activities out here that are impacting the world and changing things. But what he's thinking about is, oh, I'm doing something in the spirit, something that is a delight to the one who's loved me. And this is the, the context that he's, he's just delighting in the fact that he can delight in God, delight God. And these expressions are not to earn favor as he would have done, done before that Damascus Road encounter, but he's doing it out of a, the overflow of that abundance of love. So God has got to be the one that we serve. So I'm just, think of your job descriptions. Deans, center director leaders, registrars, committee members, uh, provost team. We're to serve God, and then we're to serve the student. Yeah, we know that. But when we're writing that email, are we serving our, our systems, our policies, or our procedures, or our, our work preferences, or are we serving the student? You know, there, there are lots of times when you can just do that second mile a little bit more. How can I care? How can I help? And then I was thinking, it's not only the student that we serve. Like Marcus was talking the other day, we have a B2B arrangement, a business to business, and we have to serve those who are called to serve the students. Mm -hmm. th this is a growing number of clients that we have that we're <laughs> called to serve. So we're to serve the, s the school staff. We're to serve the school leader. We're to serve the base leaders where those schools are. Actually, so we, if, in, if we're going to serve the student, we have to serve a, a wide range of others who are also called to serve the student because we are not doing that alone. We're doing that in the context of a community of many others. And, and so as you sit with your committees the next time, would you think, would you make this list of all the people that are serving the students and how are you serving them in the service of that student? This might take us beyond what we've uh, traditionally done. And then, I was thinking this is perhaps the most important thing. You know, I don't know if it's the most important. All of these are important. We need to s serve those whom the student is called to serve. And I think that I, I said not most important, but this is one where we need to do a little more focus on. As the students are called by God into various vocations, I think we have to have before us the spheres much more vividly and intentionally. As you're going about your daily business and you're, you're doing the mechanics and the um, nitty gritty, all the hard work, the heavy lifting that each of us do in our various capacities to advance the, the healthy development of a program, a project, a school, a college, all of this is to see a sphere in some community, transformed. There, there's a, it goes back to that first thing that we said, we've been called to this mission and fellowship with God in this in com out of community. Now, what's that transformation look like? Um, we talked yesterday, uh, uh, when we were thinking about the workshop, uh, there's going to be at least a, a, s a few hours thinking about the Reformation, because this is the 500th anniversary. H how does, how do we, what we're doing actually change the society? How are we serving that? If, if we're not continuously asking that question, we can replicate programs that miss the purpose, miss the, the why of the heart of God. We've been called to be change agents with God. And ultimately what we're trying to change is we're investing in students, whom God loves and deeply cherishes because he wants them to be able to impact government, media, education, families, on and on. So, how shall we serve? I got four basic questions here. And these are, again, 
these four basic questions are questions that we've repeated a number of times. This is like what all of philosophy is built upon. And so apologetics and, and stuff is around these four basic questions. And I'm going to propose a, a change to these uh, again today. And the questions, you would know them, you would have wrestled with them and uh, talked about them is ontology. Where do we come from? Teleology. Where are we going? Axiology. What is valuable? What is of ultimate worth? What is good? And then how should I live in light of that? Okay, so these, these things, m most people don't go around using the words axiology, ontology, and teleology. <laughs> but most everybody asks these questions at uh, critical moments in their life. You know, it's, it's issues of identity, where I've come from, of destiny, where am I going, and of, of value, of ethics, of morality, of right and wrong, good and bad, when we're talking about axiology. The fourth question that you always follows that is epistemology. How do we know all of the above? How do we know that what we know? And um, <coughs> you've already heard Maureen hint at this. I remember having a conversation with Mark Brokenshire, who just stepped out. I wanted to honor him. But um, just after <laughs> our first module of our executive master's in my living room, and there were just a lot of things that were percolating in my head. And, and out of that conversation, I, I realized we, we really don't want this question. We have to have this whole, uh, these, that question renewed. So let's cross that one out. Because it's too limiting. It exalts the cognitive acquisition of truth over every other form of acquisition of truth or formation being formed by truth. And so I'm going to pr propose to you a new word. You will not find it in any dictionary. <laughs> okay? This is a coined phrase. This is the first time in a PowerPoint. Okay? So um, on Marcus's birthday, a new word is born. Manthanology. Manthano is Greek, because all these words are Greek, is to learn. So in Matthew 11:29, when Jesus says, you who are tired and heavy laden, come learn from me. Manthano. Learn from me. And how does that work with him? It's by being yoked to him. Wow. I'm sure that while, you know, two oxen are yoked together, uh, there's some mooing back and forth, and uh, there's some communication, but it's, it's the carrying the load together. There's a, it's a kinesthetic activity that is suggested there, not a, a cognitive lecture, not a symposium of ideas. Okay? He says, one, learn from me, then be yoked to me, walk with me, journey with me, have intimate relationship with me. And, and I think we've done really good in our university up till now. And this is so I just love how this works. Is I'm working along this in my own thinking, and then I, I see Maureen produce how do we reframe the DTS and very parallel tracks. And these are like coming from low different angles, confirming some of the same processes or directions. But what we've done in the past is we said, you know, our, our university is different from other universities. We don't just do the cognitive. We, we do the effective and we do the tactile. So we have head, heart, hands, knowledge, character, skills. We all do that, and that's good. But you know, when you think about it, how does learning happen? Sometimes it is sparked by an idea. Sometimes it is sparked by an emotion. There's, you walk into a situation and there's a feeling, there's just something mm, not right or about something, or you get really excited about it, and you go, what was that? And you, you start a process of inquiry, of discovery uh, through, through that. And sometimes it's sparked by an action. You know, you go and build a home of hope. And you, you spend a, a day there and you, and you see the tears of the family as they receive the keys and walk in. You go, oh, did I ever learn something today? Your back is aching. You're, you know, you got blisters on, on your hand because you've not y y held a hammer in a very long time. And, but you've learned something. And it's, it's, there, there was not any lecture, uh, but there was growth 
there was development. And so learning can begin in multiple different ways and can be supplemented and egg, egg, uh, urged on in complementary relationship by the other aspects. And so we are, we're trying to learn how to do all of that. And we've, we've tried to do this, and you have to do each of these things, but we still have kind of a... Here's the problem. We, we say, we, we know through cognitive things, we know through effective things, we know through tactile things. And by using that language, we know, we know, we know, we exalt the cognitive a little bit more. It's like, that's really where it's at, and the others are support elements. Are you with me? And so just changing from we know to we learn, it puts the cognitive on a pure relationship with the others. Words are important. Uh, a change of vocabulary does change uh, the way we understand and behave. And I think that all, although all of these can be sparked by these different things, uh, they're established through relationship and habituation. It's out of intimacy, it's in community, uh, fellowship with God and with one another, and it's the practice of being involved in the mission of God. Is doing those things over and over and over again that it becomes part of who we are. Because our learning is not just an acquisition of information. It's about us becoming transformed so that we can be agents of transformation. That would be a good place for at least one or two amens. Okay? So I'm just, uh, these are some of the things that are kind of well established. And I'm just with the, the, the change on the four basic presuppositions and the, these four basic questions, I'd just like to do this. Let me just think about this menthonology. Uh, Mark 3, 14 to 15. I just, this is one of my favorite passages out of the Gospels. He appointed 12. You know, and he called them the disciples, which has a religious connotation, but it just means students, pupils, learners. And they never graduated. They never, they never stopped being the l learners, right? And he appointed them, and there were two reasons, that they might be with him, that's the intimacy piece, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. That's the mission piece. So there's purpose and there's fellowship. There's fellowship and there's purpose, okay? And there's tho those two elements are the very reason why he said, I want you to be part of this community and learn from me. I want to have an established relationship and I want to have this purpose.